uh, by removing better creatures, keeping the battalion from triggering. Uh, Nathan, no two drop it seems, just goes for the Dried Militant, or he's being really conservative and wants to keep Brave the Elements up, which I, I see that card in his hand as well. So, in, in uh, Beatdown Mirrors, it's very rarely two ships passing in the night, assuming the, the players can block one another's creatures. And with Lundquist on the draw, already a little bit on the back foot, he's going to be trying to play more of a defensive game, try to block and give him some time to deploy uh, some of his threats here. Yeah, we see him making a, a decision point this turn. He can cast Precinct Captain and play a Mutavault untapped, or he can use a Mutavault in one of his lands already in play to cast a, a Daring Skyjack, I believe, or an Azorius Rester, and then he also has a Soldier of the Pantheon. To, so he can decide between Precinct Captain or two creatures that are both worse than Precinct Captain, basically. Or he can also play as a Johnny this turn and plus it because Nathan sure. on board cannot uh, kill a Johnny. Looks like he's going to opt for the two-creature plan, try and get ahead of what Nathan's doing. And I really like Lundquist trying to take a defensive position here. He's going to attack with both. Trades his Boros Elite for a Brave the Elements, which probably is fine. That's one of the least destructive trades that he can make against that particular spell. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure Lundquist is thrilled with that. Banisher Priest slowing Ben down. Banisher Priest, a pretty, pretty huge trump to have access to in game one in the mirror match here. Yeah, there are not a lot of ways to remove it in most of these decks, and Ben specifically decided to eschew lightning strikes, so he doesn't have any in his main deck. Yeah. But he still has a lot of action in his hand here. Let's see, Precinct Captain. And he's got the option between Arrester and it uh, looked like a Dryad Militant. He can also say go with just his mutable ult back on defense, too. What's sure. attractive about that is it means that he no longer has to worry about Brave inside of combat if he wants to make a block. Yeah, he can again keep it down to just a one-for-one one at most, uh, assuming the Skyjack would ever block. Uh, looks like he goes for the Arrester. I assume we're going to target the Militant here because uh, Lundquist is very happy to trade with either the Sovereign or the Banisher Priest. So uh, if Nathan wants to attack and trade with, with either one of those cards, that's totally fine. And you're exactly right. Uh, Nathan's Dried Militant does, in fact, get arrested. And looks like he has a Boros Charm and a Boros Elite in his hand to continue to add pressure presence to the board. But whether he wants to actually go about attacking this turn, he can use the Boros Charm to get a uh, double strike. In this case, basically just first strike to let him run through that Daring Skyjack. The, the problem from Nathan's side of the board right now is that Precinct Captain's likely to go unchecked here. And an unchecked Precinct Captain is... It generates a, a huge edge. In a matchup that's all about 2-1 and 3-1 creatures, mm -hmm. something that makes a 1-1 every turn is quite powerful. Yeah, so he decides not to burn his Boros Charm on that attack, and he's just sitting back. So Lundquist now with a, a plethora of options. The Ajani also gives him the line, potentially, of just jumping and double striking the Precinct Captain, mm -hmm. which generates two tokens. And puts Nathan in a position where he's kind of compelled to attack because he can't let Ajani go unchecked, but any alpha strike he makes is going to incur some serious losses. You can also and play a little bit more conservatively, simply uh, put a counter on his precinct captain, which is still quite positive for him here. Yeah, and it makes it close to unbeatable in combat. Uh, Nathan would no longer be able to even block to kill it. Yeah. So that's what he does. Lundquist is going to take a slightly more conservative route. But this is still a very powerful sequence. Yep, and that soldier token should be coming into play tapped for the imposing sovereign. But uh, Ben's still, you know, quite well preserved with a Mutavault, a Daring Skyjack, and an Azorius Arrestor on D. So Nathan, I, again, he has Brawl's Charm in hand, so he can kind of freely alpha strike because he can give his team indestructible and uh, curious to see how he's going to distribute his attacks amongst what's coming at Ajani and what is coming at Lundquist. Yeah, he's going to attack here and I feel like he probably wants to send Skyjack at Ajani and then as well as like Sovereign and Militant probably and then everything else at Ben. So Lundquist needs to make blocks where 
He protects himself against Brave the Elements and Boros Charm blowing him out, but also the the blocks have to be juicy enough to induce one of those tricks out of Nathan if he has it. So right. He needs to find the balancing act between inducing Nathan to use a trick if he has one uh, while not uh, losing maximum value in the event that Nathan does. This is one of those interesting situations where, you know, just bra Brave the Elements, like, you wouldn't use it to run the falter effect. Like, you would actually be trying to scoop creatures in combat with it. And Ben, we see, makes the most conservative of blocks, uh, just putting the Arrestor on the Banisher Priest to trade with that Boros Charm if Nathan's willing to blow it, and he's not. So. It looks like... I'm guessing everything went into Johnny based on uh, this combat. Nathan just making wants to make sure the Planeswalker dies, doesn't want to just shrink it. Yeah. Uh, just really, really tight play from Lundquist. Just very conscious of what the situation was, what the risk and rewards mm -hmm. are. and uh, By not attacking Ben at all, Nathan's kind of opened himself up to being taken advantage of by a conservative block like that. Uh, if some of those creatures were going at Ben's face, he might be getting lower in damage. Then the Boros Charm becomes a threat both to his life total and his board. Yes. It's hard to defend from it on both fronts, but because he gets to still sit at 16, and his board is even looking better than Nathan's at this stage, now it's gotten a lot more interesting. That Boros Charm's ability to clock Ben is limited, both now because Ben doesn't necessarily need to block. He can actually just attack for more damage. Uh, and also, his life's not as threatened. He doesn't have to worry about the four damage. And, and Lundquist drew Boros Charm of his own, so now he has a Oof. lot of flexibility, both if he can use the indestructible mode, if Nathan does the same thing inside of mm -hmm. combat, and now also Nathan's life toll is pretty pretty important too because Lundquist can threaten lethal in not that long. He's got a lot of pressure on the board already. I almost feel like a Boros Charm draw from Ben was kind of like uh, sort of a, a, a double-edged sword, though, because now he might be incentivized to make like so many different plays. Uh, as opposed to just jamming, and I really like attacking. And it looks like Ben agrees. He just wants to battle. And you see him leave the soldier back on defense because that just increases the opportunity cost of attacking with Dryad Militant, mm -hmm. although he's still debating here. So he gives up a point to potentially make Nathan's attacks far more awkward, yeah. but uh, Lundquist is going to sit back. Appears with... Just a soldier token. Okay. I imagine he plans to wash, rinse, repeat his blocks from the previous turn under the assumption that Nathan has something like a Boros Charm or Brave Elements, with the soldier token probably going on Imposing Sovereign this time around. Uh, Ben's basically going to just see how many times is Nathan willing to alpha into a, uh, a chump attack before he burns his trick. And now that he himself has a Boros Charm, he can even protect against it if need be. Yeah. Nathan on seven, uh, dead to the Boros Charm in Ben's hand if he can't kill Ben or find some way to prevent... Uh, a daring skyjack from coming over the top. And it looks like a Johnny was the draw for Nathan. That's not going to do it. Uh, so he'll need something real creative here, or uh, we're going to find him ourselves going to game two with Ben up a game. Plays the Johnny. That's basically a... Uh, Best possible thing Ben can see because now he knows there's really not a trick Nathan can realistically have that prevents that Skyjack from coming over. Is someone going to be playing Shock over Lightning Strike in this deck? That doesn't seem very likely. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, I really feel like Lundquist has navigated this game very well. Mm -hmm. He's just... Uh, played conservatively when that was called for and has opened it up and shifted gears when uh, he had an edge and just drew Boros Charm. Yeah, he really had the flexibility and because his life total remained high enough that he didn't have to worry about getting counterattacked for lethal, he was able to play deftly around his opponent's Boros Charm and uses his own to dispatch Nathan, sending them to the sideboard. Uh, I know that Lundquist absolutely despises Boros Charm and any sort of th <laughs> anything resembling a creature mirror. Those are going to be the first four things to get out of the deck. He has uh, quite a few powerful cyborg cards to bring in. He has four copies of Banisher Priest. He has two copies of Glare of Heresy, two copies of Mizia Mortars, and a Fire Main Adventure. All potentially excellent here. All very powerful cards to be sure. Uh, moving over to Nathan's sideboard. His sideboard actually looks very similar. Uh, all told, he has two Fiend Slayer Paladins, two Frontline Medics, two Bo more Boros Charms. He's only running two in the main. Uh, two Glare of Heresy, a Pacifism, two Burning Earths, and four Boros Reckoner. Uh, he's already got those Banisher Priests in the main deck, so his, like, anti-creature three, uh, I imagine he brings it in mostly against red decks, is Boros Reckoner. Yeah. Uh, that, those decks have a lot of trouble removing this creature. He can board his Banisher Priests out. 
Here, he doesn't really want to overload his deck with three drops because they're not that great in the matchup. As we saw, you know, he got kind of stuck on mana when he drew a three drop with a two in his hand, only had four lands. Uh, he'll certainly be bringing in the glares and the pacifism to complement what he's already got going on in there. And I imagine maybe some of these Boros Reckoners because the two Ajani and the two Spears are not ideal. And as he has his own Boros Charms, he'll probably want to get rid of those as well. I actually think that uh, pacifism is is pretty poor against White Weenie because of Bravely Elements. Sure. That's already a critical card in the matchup, and then pacifism is just another thing that, that makes it worse if you have it. Uh, I know that some people bring it in just because answering Precinct Captain early is the right. most important thing. When someone gets run out of the gym in the mirror match, it almost <laughs> always involves Precinct Captain going yeah. unchecked. And in that game, it was ultimately what gave Lundquist the edge. He yeah. got a Precinct Captain to play. Nathan didn't have his own nor enough of a... a an early advantage to 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 push through it. Uh, so some people like to bring in pacifism as another answer, but I think because of Brave the Elements, it's not a card you should be bringing in the post-port games. All right, that's fair. Uh, as a singleton, I, I see some credit. Uh, he also has Fiendslayer Paladin if he wants access to another first-striking two-power creature to kind of supplement things. Uh, honestly, it seems like he doesn't really have as many powerful cards as he'd like to bring in. Ben's, you know, got the reverse. His main deck is geared against other matchups with a ton of cards to bring in here, uh, whereas Nathan's main deck already kind of geared toward this matchup, but still has a few more bricks in the main than he has sideboard options. Yeah, I would imagine that Longquest is going to be cutting certainly his four Boros Charms, his two frontline medics, and uh, a bunch of his dry militant type creatures, the, mm -hmm. the one drops, because the games become longer and more attritiony. You want more high impact cards. For and militant against Pan Soldier of the Pantheon is especially mediocre. Yes. So. Uh, and for uh, the more powerful three drops, especially Banisher Priest and uh, Fire Main Avenger and more red removal. Yeah, it looks like Ben's sideboard leaves him with a bit of an edge because he just has more removal post board. Not by a lot, but by a, a noticeable amount. And Fire Main Avenger is actually quite good in the mirror match. Yeah, if you untap with a Fire Main Avenger in play and you know, the prerequisite two other creatures to attack with. It should be very, very difficult to lose, and considering the deck has access to Mutavolt, not to mention just swarms of white creatures, uh, it should be a pretty easy situation to engineer, assuming you can run your opponent out of removal spells. Yeah. It's also a 3-3, three -three, which matches up really well against <laughs> Precinct Captain and Friends. So. Yeah, very true. I know that Ben said he played uh, the Fire Main Adventure in Albuquerque and that it was awesome for him, led to him deciding to run it back today. Yeah. Clearly has paid off, uh, he's accrued a 7-1 record. Yeah, it, it used to be War Leader's Helix in that slot, but uh, against similar decks, I think the, the Avenger is much more powerful. I like to shoot for the stars in those situations. <laughs> I, I don't like to settle for my War Leader's Helix. I, I want a Lightning Helix every turn. Well, Helix is much better against red decks. Oh, of course, yeah. In, in White Creature Mirrors, uh, Avenger is excellent. Looks like keeps from both players. Well, Lundquist appears to be debating this one. Yep, still thinking. Uh, looks like a one-lander. I think he might just be on one planes. Yeah, I think you're right about that, but clearly tempted. Oh, I like I like me a one-lander. Me too. I love him. Can't get enough. We see Nathan has kept in at, at least some of his militants, leads with one on turn one, and Ben keeping apparently a one-lander with no one-drop. Yeah, he's got a bunch of arresters and glare. Mm-hmm. Well, we see, you know, he keeps this hand that's got one of his sideboard cards, which automatically increases the value of the hand in and of itself. And he does find the second planes right on top. Uh, now he's got a lot of options. He has arresters, he has glare, he has precinct captain. I think it's battle of what's time. Oh, uh, he's just going to arrest. Okay. All right. Soldier of the Pantheon under arrest. <laughs> I assume uh, Precinct Captain is your Battle of Wits equivalent yeah. here. If untap, untap control, it, yeah. <laughs> with it under your control, <laughs> win the game. Correct. Uh, probably he's a little fearful of a Banisher Priest ruining his fun there and, and just leaving him taking six damage and getting too far behind. Uh, he also may want to just trade with with the removal that Nathan theoretically can have. Mm -hmm. You know, That's another, another incentive. Just bleed out the removal with this kind of stuff and then eventually get to stake, stake up Precinct Captain. Imposing Sovereign, a little bit of a punishment on that line now because now none of his creatures can actually trade on defense. He'll probably just be priced into arresting again so that he can untap with the rest and play another guy. Or he just goes for the glare. Burning the glare on the Sovereign kind of burns because now he doesn't have an option against a new Banisher Priest, but Nathan has demonstrated he lacked a third land at the time, so that makes the glare maybe a little easier to part with. <laughs> Finds the third land now, though, and casts two creatures 
It's going to be tough for Ben to claw out now. Uh, we see Precinct Captain, a.k.a. Battle of Wits, uh, and that puts Nathan to 8 power on the field against Ben's 12 life. Ben will be hard-pressed to fight back. He's going to arrest the Precinct Captain here yep. and make a land drop. Can't afford the shock land, doesn't have a one drop to play with it in any way. And he'll be trading off and going to 8 here, uh, assuming Nathan allows him to. But I, I smell that Banisher Priest landing. Yeah. That'll put Ben down to uh, 6 life. The risk on this line, I think, is if the if that Banisher Priest gets Banisher Priest, then uh, Ben can actually start to claw it out of this, potentially. Right. Has a Muta Vault. And, yep, we see Ben's Banisher Priest comes down, takes Banisher Priest. Azorius Arrester, no doubt, hitting the Precinct Captain again. And I think Nathan has no action. I think he just has a land in his hand. I agree. So. He uh, He's out. But he can attack in here. He'll get in two damage, and Ben will probably just trade off both creatures and let the Banisher Priest come back, removing nothing. Yes, that's a fairly attractive. Keep his life total reasonably high. Yeah, it looks like... I think that's the line he considers. He, if he blocks with the Banished Priest at all, he's almost just certainly has to block with the Arrester. So, yeah, that's exactly what happens here. Drops down to four life, but does return a creature to Nathan. Has to just hope Nathan's all out, and he is rewarded. Another Ajani the draw. Once more under arrest. Precinct Captain, clearly a violator at this yes. point. <laughs> like... Another land for Nathan. Wow, Ben might just be coming back out of this. It's Bone saws still ready. gonna be dicey. Of uh, any brave yellow mints at almost any oh, point, it's yeah. still gonna be real, just almost game on the spot. But this is an incredible rally. Wow, Mizium Mortars. Wow, Mizium Mortars continues to pull out. Uh, I think we just go for the the mortars on Captain and get in with our Captain here, right? Uh, there's an ar argument for Ajani and uh, Ajani and just jump the Precinct Captain too. Yeah, but I think I guess that, that I think that still leaves us dead to brave, and as long as we have that mutable on defense, we can avoid that scenario, right? No, he's got. Uh, I yes, this is a hedge against brave, I guess. Because if we untap from this position, I think we're in pretty strong shape, especially as soon as we hit a fifth land, we always have the mutable. It's a bummer that the banisher priest can profitably block our one ones. Otherwise, we could just, you know throw ourselves into the red zone with Abandon. Yeah. Soldier of the Pantheon, the draw for Nathan. Now he's uh, he's stuck in uh, that mode where you just play a guy, hope I draw a Brave the Elements, or if he's left them in, Boros Charm. Yeah. And... Lundquist with so many Ajani's in his hand can start setting up <laughs> some really awesome turns, too. Yeah. He can actually, you know, go for the, the neg immediately if he wants and then play another one next turn plus, or he can just start plussing, uh, set up a neg, get in for a bunch of damage. He can get multiple double strikes going in the same turn, even. Yeah, quadruple strike. <laughs> <laughs> two times two. And he does have that fifth land to turn on Muta Vault. Uh, however, it's not enough to save him now. Uh, a Brave the Elements oh. will still be lethal. Well, there, I believe that appears to be a lethal Ajani. That as does. As he can give Flying and Double Strike to one of his creatures. Nathan does, in fact, it appear, aim it at Banisher Priest, and then he sends it in. Ben and picks him game. up. A valiant wow. effort, but uh, overcome by Nathan's number of outs. And uh, you saw that in that game, uh, Azorius Arrester was really powerful for oh, he, a long quest. Yeah, he was very significant, especially as a way to fight back against A being on the draw and B getting Imposing Sovereign. Yeah, Lundquist actually came up to me in between rounds and was asking me if he thought he should be drawing in the Boros Mirror in the sideboarding games. Because he can just fend off for enough time with Azorius Arresters. Uh, I, I feel like you can't go down that line because the early damage matters so much because yeah. of Brave the Elements, you can just die. But there is a, an argument once you have a lot of Azorius Arresters in your deck to go second and just, you know, faint and dodge a little bit allow the, your board to develop, and then start deploying your Ajani's and other threes. Because in the post-board games, both decks are adding so many three and four mana spells. Mm -hmm. You know, that every Boros deck goes down to, you know, bringing in a bunch of frontline medics and, you know, Boros Records, additional Ajani's, potentially additional spears. Those are the sideboard plans. And so, but you're still only playing 22 lands or what have you. So 
you often will miss your third land drop, and that can be disastrous in these post-port games yeah. because you have so many threes. So there is some merit to drawing. Uh, I, again, I still think ultimately it's correct to play, but with certainly Lundquist having access to Azorius Arrestor makes it potentially even more compelling to draw first. Yeah, Ben uh, perhaps revisiting his consideration of that one land keep, no doubt wishing, God, if it's just a one, one drop then uh, maybe that whole game just gets undone if he uh, just finds one on turn one. And uh, that also, I'm sure, affected his decision to keep it in the first place. Not only was a land a very good draw, but any one drop off the top since he was on the draw would have been you know, a huge hedge. Yeah, I mean, he drew, he drew fairly well. Oh, sure, he centered, definitely but... did. Uh, but, you know, certainly likely going to be uh, thinking that decision over. Unless he wins this game, then he'll probably pay it never a second thought. <laughs> Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I kind of like to keep there. The upside on that hand is so huge if he draws a right. white source of mana in the first couple turns. It can even be mutable because he has so many arresters to yeah. give himself time. I like keeping hands that are speculative like that when all of the cards are the cards you want, you know? Like, if you were going to mulligan to five and see three or four of your best cards in the matchup, you're totally fine with that over a mediocre seven. Yeah. And the same principle holds for, like, weak sevens, quote, unquote, weak sevens, uh, you know, that have a fatal flaw, assuming you can get out of that flaw, you just have a ton of powerful cards. Yeah, I mean, Lundquist had a precinct captain, multiple arresters, and a Johnny in that and opening And a glare. Set. And a glare, so you can't yeah. ask. Those are all of his best cards. If you randomly shuffled any of those cards away for a planes, the hand would be a snap keep, so it's pretty tempting to assume you're going to find one in the top two, or at least a one-drop to slow down the opponent. Yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna mulligan hands like that, why even show up? Yeah, you know if why even? If you're gonna mulligan hands like that, then you you need to be sleeping up mono black or something. Why are you, <laughs> why are you even showing up to the tournament? <laughs> so Lundquist presumably will be on the play here. Although I don't know this. Yeah, he may have decided to experiment against your advice. Uh. <laughs> Let's see who blinks first. Looks like Ben announces the keep first and then Nathan Mulligan. So, yeah, that's, it's Ben on the play. So what do you think about Lundquist's build with the, the four Azorius Arrestor and no imposing Sovereign? You know, i got to be honest. I, I didn't think Azorius Arrestor would make it to the big times. Yeah. I've, I've been wrong about a lot of cards. That wasn't one of the ones I expected to be wrong about. Uh, it's pretty interesting to watch it play out. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the Boros deck, having seen it its game against mostly the control decks. I, I really think it's a more powerful creature-based strategy than a lot of people give it credit for. And yeah, I would rather sleep this deck up than say something like the, the red aggro deck or the red devotion deck, I think. Mm -hmm. Especially in this uh, world that's getting defined by mono black and all of its, you know, willing to enter into attrition. You know, having something like a Jani against mono black is huge. A way to turn any creature into a significant threat. Uh, I, I really like that. Yeah, I think... You know, I've said a couple times on the broadcast, I think Vita Vault's the most powerful card in standard. I sure. think this is the best between being an attacking deck in general and having so many battalion effects. This is the most powerful deck, that, uh, most powerful use of Vita Vault in the format. Yeah, we see matching Soldier of the Pantheon starting off here. And it looks like Ben's got the potential to go one better. He has uh, another Soldier of the Pantheon in his hand, and I believe another one drop to go with it, Boros Elite. Yep. And he's going to pass turn with the ability to turn on the battalion on his soldier next turn. Nathan, only a second soldier, also passes. Going to have to defend himself, likely by trying to trade soldiers. And Pretty dangerous. Though. This attack might have been a little rough because Brave the Elements is really risky here. But now, the Arrestor. The Arrestor to the rescue. Uh, even a Brave is just a one for one. And the Arrestor entering play will also allow Ben to once again have Battalion on the next turn, even if he loses a creature to Brave. And it looks like that's exactly what's going to happen. Ben loses one soldier, gets in five damage, has a scry land to follow. Things appear to go be, be going swimmingly for him. Has red mana as well, a glare in hand. A lot of really good tools. Yeah. Sends the card to the bottom, and uh, it's on Nathan. He's under pressure. He's got two Banisher Priests in his hand, one of them a fresh draw off the top, but he's going to have to take some Shockland damage to get that 2-2 into play. And as we know, Ben's just going to likely glare it, uh, assuming that that's an advantageous play for him. I wonder what, what Nathan's debating here. Perhaps which creature yeah. to glare. Once he takes the Shock, he's kind of just yeah. committed to the, the Banisher Priest. And yeah, he does decide to go with Soldier of the Pantheon. So, Lundquist with land. Daring Skyjack. Yeah, he has, I believe, land, Daring Skyjack, glare in his hand, so 
You can exile the Banisher Priest, try to set up an attack on the next turn, but this board's not really materializing into anything especially favorable. Uh, without a Brave or something to let him start pushing through, he's just going to be ramming his creatures into trades. Looks like he's going to go for the more conservative, just the Skyjack and send the turn. Hold the glare, see what develops on Nathan's turn. Need a vault to draw for Nathan. Good draw for Nathan. He can now play another Banisher Priest and hold up Braid the Elements. Uh, I believe he has a second copy in his hand. And that'll put Ben in a real bind. The Sorcery Speed Glare, not one of your best weapons against Braid the Elements. And now both of these players just kind of looking for their Haymakers. Ajani, Precinct Captain. Mm -hmm. Lundquist is in a spot now where his own Braid the Elements is, is pretty powerful as he has a lot of pressure on the table. Looks like Nathan will go with a second Banisher Priest and then pass the turn. Doesn't want to trade any of these guys off. Not attacking here also uh, you know, gives him a lot more defense against a Brave, but I, would, I think I would kind of, I don't know, I feel like I would be willing to attack. Maybe that's too greedy, I don't know. And really, I really like that play a lot from Nathan. Just no hesitation, yes. just immediately exiled his Banisher Priest. Really can lead Lundquist to believe that there's no Brave the Elements in his hand. Yeah, if, if I were Ben, I would be hard-pressed to assume my opponent had a Brave the Elements when he just immediately exiles his creature without even picking up the card or thinking about anything. Uh, so, you know, good good, good focus on that one. That's a play right out of Lundquist's own playbook, so <laughs> now he has to think, am I getting trapped by this, or yeah. does he really have nothing? Because this could be the whole tournament right here. If he, makes a, if he makes a too aggressive attack into Brave the Elements, that could just be the ball game. He arrests Soldier and passes, does not attack. Nathan's on 13, Ben perhaps uh, willing to make the fight come to him. Nathan doesn't have a creature that can attack you know, without trading, so Ben can once again wash and repeat the style of attack we saw him make before. Oh, this might give Ben an opening. Nathan taps out of white mana for Boros Reckon, or just a Mutavolt up, so Assuming Ben can repeal away to actually handle that Boros Reckoner, might be able to make something develop. And I think Lundquist is also fine being in a holding pattern and just letting the boards develop because uh, he has such he has much more inevitability because of Brave the Elements. Mm -hmm. Nathan is much lower. He doesn't have to worry about Nathan killing him with Brave the Elements for a very long time, and so uh, he's happier to let the board develop. Though that changes now with Boros yeah. Reckoner as Nathan can start going on the offensive with the Reckoner and possibly shortening the window that Lundquist has. Uh, also worth noting is it looks to like Nathan, you know, uh, the Boros Reckoner in play, Soldier of the Pantheon, not digging him out. So. Is that another Banisher Priest? Uh, looks a bit like one. That's a glare in his hand. Oh, a glare. Well. About the same difference for uh, for Nathan, and his Boris Reckoner can safely go on the offensive. He's going to hold on to his glare, wants to save it for one of the problem cards. Priesting Captain Ajani, another Banisher Priest from, uh, from Ben. Yep. That Reckoner is really threatening, as, as it's really important for Nathan to have some sort of clock that he can attack with freely and not trade uh, to allow this Brave to potentially shorten the game. Yep. Previously, Ben had, you know, Nathan's lower life total in the top of his own deck to pressure Nathan, but now uh, it's Ben who's under the actual pressure. He's the one who needs to find something to break up a stalemate that favors Nathan. He does find a Johnny, which is not nothing. It's going to be putting a counter somewhere. Question is where. It's got a bunch of one toughness creatures in play, which is not ideal when facing down two soldiers of the Pantheons that would happily give their lives for the cause. Decides to go with the Skyjack, the highest power on the board. And the one uh, most important to have large if there's an Alpha Strike. Yep. And it looks like Lundquist is going to be making a move here, probably sending Muta Vault, Boros Elite, and Daring Skyjack. Yep. So this is 
this is a uh, aggressive move by Lundqvist that also doesn't ruin him in the event that Nathan has braved the elements because yeah. only the Boros Elite gets eaten up. The Muta Vault isn't, uh, isn't a colored card, so nothing to be done there with Brave. The Skyjack is flying, and so this is kind of the best best of both worlds for Lundqvist. Yeah, the Muta Vault can trade off with anything uh, on Nathan's side, and Nathan, it appears, is going to be trading off his own Muta Vault for it, just interesting. Uh, and then he can double block on the Boros Elite and use the Brave if he wants to just basically kill Boros Elite, but more importantly, preserve his soldiers, which yep. that's what it looks like he does. And getting rid of that, that Muta Vault is actually uh, subtly pretty important here mm -hmm. as it's one of Nathan's best protections against Brave the Elements from Lundquist. Yeah, I think Nathan's willing to trade off against Ben's Muta Vault, though, because now that he untaps, he has that Glare of Heresy in hand. He can use that to exile the Daring Skyjack. Uh, that'll remove all of Ben's, like, relevant threats, basically, from the board as he then can attack the Ajani. He can also just exile the Ajani and decide to deal with everything else in another way. He is on 9, though, so I, I feel like you just want to get that 4-power creature off the board. Nathan with a, a land drawn, so... He's, he's going after Uber. Azorius Arrestor. Arrestor. And I guess he's just is intending on sending everything at Ajani. Yeah, he has to probably kill the Ajani, otherwise he's dead to a brave. And yeah, I imagine this is all going at Ajani. Ben's just going to bin it. Not unreasonable attack as it strips battalion. Although I would have sent the Basher Priest and not the Soldier, uh, because blocking with the Basher Priest is so bad here. And... Uh, Nathan is almost priced into blocking. Sure, sure, I get that. Ben just sends the arrester, sort of uh, daring Nathan to block. That means he probably drew a creature, so he wants to get Nathan into seven and then can play the creature, and that's exactly what he does now. If Nathan flips his attacks last turn, for example, he could just trade there. Right. And all the tra right now, the trading is so powerful for Nathan because the primary concern he has is Brave the Almonds. Boros Reckoner is going to dominate this game in the long term, assuming that Nathan doesn't get basically killed out of nowhere. But now, uh, taking that hit, it means Brave the Almonds is lethal, and now means another Ajani is lethal as giving Flying and Double Strike to the Daring yeah. Skydrake is a kill. Something as subtle as that, that, that could make a big difference in this game depending on what Lundquist's draw steps are can make or break and it looks like Nathan has another creature I can't tell what it is uh, it looks like it might be a fiend slayer paladin or a boros elite but he's just going to send in his soldier of the pantheons creatures he's very willing to lose uh, keeping his blockers that are really good at that job uh, on D Ben trades the boros elite because it's not doing much I think Ben's probably just thinking he wants to preserve a way to he wants to preserve the most number of outs a johnny obviously just kills with in combination with the daring skyjack but if he throws away the boros elite then a braid the elements is no longer lethal yes so he's limiting himself down to just three ajani's for outs if he makes this block and that's what he does but he's giving himself quite a bit more time right <laughs> and there's fiend slayer paladin. slayer paladin well now it's going to be pretty much now or never for ben as once nathan gains two life uh, ben will be in trouble I'm going to guess that that wasn't an Ajani he drew, uh, but he's surveying the board. Looks like he passes turn. If it was a Brave the Elements, uh, might still be able to make something happen and throw a creature in front of the Fiend Slayer Paladin, get pro white, and fend off the gain two and give himself another draw step at Ajani while removing the lifelinking threat from his path. So it'll be interesting to see how Nathan addresses this particular combat. Banisher Priest, uh, that creates a nice safety net. And the third one, obviously, a uh, bit of a uh, bit of a tilt in the matchup to have this many Banisher Priests. Yeah, Luck was still without any of his without any of his priests. Yeah, the the three to zero ratio is definitely distorting it. And Ben's hand are two lands, which leaves him extending the hand in defeat. Wow, tight fight. Yep. So Nathan McWilliams wins two games to one in the red-white aggro mirror, uh, likely locking up a top eight berth for himself. For Lundquist now, uh, two losses and probably just playing out the stretch next round. Yeah, I know Ben's looking for a uh, top 32 finish, 
at minimum, I believe, to uh, qualify him for some number of buys, I think, at the, the Las Vegas Invitational. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what his point threshold uh, situation is at, but he has a... Uh, uh, quite a uh, quite a string of good performances lately. Yep. He has an invitational top eight this season. He has an open win, and uh, so it wouldn't surprise me to see him at, you know, that he's currently caught kind of on the bubble of uh, buys for the invitational. Yeah, I think this would be for one buy. Uh, that's my my layman's guess. 